Warm Christian greetings from the Oxford Centre and uh, Global Institute for Leadership Development here in the UK. Uh, it is my privilege to be presenting uh, some of my own experiences and journey in innovative pedagogy and curricula to this very in this very important virtual meeting. I also extend my heartful thanks to the organizing team to uh, for inviting me. Special thanks to Dr. Kevin Rogers for uh, not only inviting, but being in touch with me and encouraging me so that I'll be able to make this presentation to you all. As I share with you, this is my own personal journey. Almost a year back when the pandemic hit the entire world, and especially theological education and institutions were trying to find ways and methods to uh, reach out new ways of engaging in uh, teaching and reaching out to their own students. Uh, this experience comes from that. And I have to tell you, we had the privilege of engaging with several uh, institutions right across the global south to begin with from India and then in Africa and then also in Asia. And uh, when we engaged with several uh, Christian leaders and several scholars, uh, we also found out the challenges that they are facing, but also a kind of a spirit to move forward in these challenging times. And many of them opened up and found themselves in, in a period where they, would be able, they were able to reach out to many more people through innovative methods and creative methods so that uh, they could make a difference in their own local context. Uh, so I hope to bring that experience, especially as I was developing my own program called the Shepherds Academy, where I was had the privilege of engaging with several scholars in the global south, right from the Pacific to Asia, Africa, and also Latin America. And I hope this presentation would be really helpful to you and also would be a blessing as it was uh, a blessing to myself as I was preparing for this conference. Today, my presentation is going to be on the topic, innovative pedagogy and curricula in theological education. Uh, and this, as I said, comes from my own experience. Uh, and I hope you would benefit. Uh, my presentation has three general uh, topics. The first gives us the idea why we need to pay attention to our theological education and we need to be very creative. Second, it provides you a kind of a landscape of contemporary theological education. And thirdly, it explores the possibility of being innovative in four different areas, which I would like to present. And I hope this would be, a, uh, be helpful to you. To begin with, and I think it's very important that transformation in theological education is the key factor for, we, for what we, each one of us as theological educators are engaging in. Uh, one of the CAF factors that we are involved in is to have holistic formation. And what does it entail? I know traditionally we have always focused on this aspect of what we call as academic formation, where much emphasis is given to knowledge. Alongside, I think what we also have identified and it's been, uh, been engaged, uh, we've been engaging in is what we call as ministerial formation. Now, each and every theological student who enters into a seminary or a Bible college will find some kind of en engagement in the church, either his own church or her own church, or it could be in a church where they will be placed. Alongside this, and I find three more important factors that needs to be involved in the formation. And I see that these, is, these areas and aspects will bring transformation, not only in theological education as such, but also the result that would be seen in the lives of the students. The third important component that we all aspire for is the formation in the aspect of character and virtue, that a as a person, one, a person would develop in character and virtue. The fourth area, which is equally important, is that what all that student reads or studies in a classroom needs to also make 
uh, be meaningful in his own local context. So the learning is not only for personal gain or to uh, have some kind of a professional degree, rather it has to benefit the local community. And in the form, when you, and I say local community, it could be as simple as his own family, to the church or his neighborhood. But besides all this, there is another important aspect that the students needs to form, and that is his engagement in the public sphere. We, we have this, we have heard this uh, phrase, salt in the marketplace. We many a time forget that theological students do not remain in the seminary all the time. They will be engaging in the public context. So if such so, if such is the case, then how are we helping our students to engage in the public context? How is Christian belief and practices make sense to not only to themselves, but while they engage in the public context? So it is important that we need to give, uh, give emphasis to transformation in theological education in holistic formation. And this, all these four, five aspects, there might be many, but I think these five are the key aspects. Let me move to the next important uh, area before I launch into the innovation, possible innovations in pedagogy and curricula. What is the contemporary landscape of theological education? Now, I have to inform you. I would see them in four different categories. Much of the theological education focus on the content where you would like to build an institution, where you would like to have certain departments in it, and perhaps also bring in some kind of a specialization in it, where you would want to uh, especially focus on the content. The student comes to gain knowledge and this knowledge needs to be transferred. Rather, uh, I would write, I would uh, explain this concept a little later, but some of the scholars say this idea or this kind of focus is more like a banking concept where you would want to transfer from teacher to student what they have learned so that the student would preserve it and pass it on. The second focus I've seen in theological education is the whole idea of focus on method. Many of them are, uh, are quite uh, familiar with a classroom where lectures are hap uh, lectures lecture and they teach to a group of students. But there is also another aspect which we call is theological education by extension where instead of lectures, the method is used as tutorials, where students engage in small cohort or one-to-one -one engagement, where the teacher is able to give some special attention to the growth of the student. Now in this pandemic, and I saw, as I said, even in this conference, much emphasis has been given on online theological education but many, many theological educators do say that pure form of online theological education might not bring in holistic formation. And hence the, the new aspect, which is called hybrid or blended learning approaches is brought into where you would have both a classroom kind of an atmosphere where it could be face-to-face -face direct, which is often called as synchronous or like a lecture, but in a tutorial setup, but also uh, through an online method where the students at their own pace are able to do their course because uh, there are no structured time during a week. And this is always uh, uh, compounded with weekly tutorials. This is the method. The next is what we call a student focus. Uh, this has been also a, quite a driver point recently where they said we should not be focusing much on the content on or the method, but much emphasis has to be given to student because student is the most important person. I call them as learners or co-learners where importance on fellowship, uh, on discipleship, on ministry, and also the whole idea of spiritual formation is given emphasis on. The final aspect, what we call is context focus, which is, uh, as we know that there is a huge uh, context that we are dealing with at present 
we have uh, an emerging church in Africa and within Africa, you have different countries with different ideas, different worldview. Uh, if such is the case that context many times defines theological education, you also have to know that theological education gets uh, is shaped sometimes because of the religious context, or it could be or because of the political context. And very often, theological education makes um, sense to people in their own language. So it need not be only in English. Probably what we are doing now is the privilege of the few. But there are many who do not have access to English language. They are non-native speakers. If such is the case, the real training happens in their own mother tongue. There are also context focused because of the denominational requirement. But besides all in all these things, especially in online education, there is this whole digital divide, the haves and the have nots, the people who could access to digital, digital knowledge or to online education and those who cannot. Uh, these are all different aspects. But what I would want to suggest is that we need to have an integrated approach where people could focus on one or two of them, but all these four elements needs to be there in their theological education. And this is very, very important for the future of theological education in order to be more innovative in all aspects, even from the infrastructure to the program uh, development or to in the pedagogical methods and also in the development of curricula or curriculum. Now let's me let me focus on to uh, special aspects of what we call as innovations that can be possible in four different areas, which I say is innovations in program, innovations in curriculum design, innovations in course delivery, and innovations in research. Now this is not I would say that it has to be on a step to step by step method. It can be done together. But I think to get one thing done, uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot say that I would not be interested in the other. All of them are interconnected in one way or another. So if you're engaging in one, you might have to think of how we could be more innovative in other aspects as well. Let me, be, let me begin with the first one, innovations in program. Now in this, whole area of innovations in program. Uh, I would not dwell much upon this aspect because this is the most common of all. Uh, we've always have regular residential classroom where students are to, asked to set aside certain amount of time and years to come to a residential learning. They are conditioned, they are given training from morning till evening and in the end, the focus is that these, at the end of this training, they would be professionals in the form of trained ministers or theological educators or Christian workers in an NGO setup. And all these have, are brilliant. And I think we need to continue with this, but I also see them to be limited because with the huge resources that, be, that has been invested in the form of infrastructure or in the form of uh, theological educators who come and train, we might have a small group of a small Bible college which caters to about 50 students or the maximum of 200 to 2000 or 200 to 500 students maximum because of its limitations. But I think what is important for the future is that we need to build in the second layer of uh, innovation that is blended online and distance learning. And I see this very important because here, we are not just training few, but we are trying to help as many as possible for those who are interested in theological education. Rather, we are democratizing theological education. The slogan would be theology for all. If that is the case, then the scope is unlimited. We can have as many people as possible. Though we might have limited resources, but building in few infrastructure, we could cater to a huge, to a good amount of students who could come and do their theological, theological education through blended learning, online learning, and distance learning. Now here, you need to be trained. You need to probably invest a little bit, but uh, it is possible. 
I would say that same uh, you know, uh, college, which has been, been focusing on giving uh, training to about 50 students, now would be able to cater to about 200 students or 250 students through online and distance learning processes. Now, because of which, not only you're expanding your own influence, but you're also trying to bring in additional income, which also brings in sustainability for your own theological, uh, or a sustainability of theological institution. The final area that I would want to insist and probably propose is that we need to have a specialized uh, training or what I would say is continuing uh, education department. Many graduates who have finished their training in their own institutions would have finished probably 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but they would like to refresh themselves. And if such is the case, what better place than their own institutions? Provided those institutions have that space, probably on a six or once in six months or once in a year, they invite about 20 or 30 graduates and alumni to come focusing on a particular theme. And this would be an excellent process of engaging with their alumni gathering, but also there would be a good method of uh, training and teaching them ongoing, on, on, uh, ongoing training and teaching these theological st uh, students and pastors who have graduated some time ago. And this is a possible way of moving forward. Now, let me go and uh, emphasize on the next one is how we could bring innovations in course design. Now, as I said, as a program, it's an overall change that needs to be made, which means when we are doing such changes, we need to also make say, some changes in the course design. And that's what I would want to emphasize that it in three areas. Now, the course, as I said, it needs to be transformative. I don't want to highlight it again because I brought this, this, this idea in my first slide, which talks about formation. It, what we need is our curriculum should focus on holistic transformation. It's just not academic, but it also to engage in spiritual character formation and bring in some kind of a public engagement. And I would have to say that this is the most important and I would vouch to say that many students who come to the seminary, they would say that, and I'm one among them, is that I've learned more not in and during the classroom, but outside the classroom, where a true character and spiritual spirituality is seen. So I think it is important that our curriculum focuses on, focuses on, uh, on transformation, holistic transformation. And that should be very clearly listed in our aims and objectives, which I would want to say. When we're talking about curriculum, this is the pure, this is the actual aim. We need to be very specific. What is your aim? Each, each course needs to be very specific in saying that what kind of transformation that you would want to bring besides academic knowledge, what kind of spiritual formation, what kind of character and public engagement. The second aspect, what I say is liberative. That is, we need to empower these students who are coming or uh, should have, uh, should, ha should, should be confident enough to be empowered so that they would be just not learners alone, but they would be able to create uh, new ways of thinking, not only for themselves, but when they go back to their own context, that they would be, uh, they would be agents of transformation. They would be people who would create multiple learning centers. It should be liberative, not only for yourself. And I think as teachers, we as teachers also have to look at that very seriously because we are not here to just create another me or another I, but rather we are empowering individuals to go out. There is a, an excellent saying, which probably many of you know, that it is better to help a person to teach how to catch a fish rather than feeding him with a fish every day. And that's what probably we need to be doing. Our theological education and our curriculum should be aiming in liberative purposes. So like, uh, finally, it also has to be collective. When I mean collective is, it is not a personal learning. It is, con it is not confined to myself, but it has to be very contextual and collective. Uh, I have to emphasize that 
uh, many of us who are living in the global south, whether in Asia or in Africa, especially, there are many indigenous principles and pedagogical principles and practices that we have. We have not made an effort to go and unearth and, 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 and bring them into our curriculum. It could be, and uh, that is what was very important, very uh, an important transformation needed. We always look at the West as the place where we would get the best, but it is not. We also have some of the best. If such is the case, how do we make it available? Are we giving that space in our curriculum? Are we giving that space for our, teach, our students to do it? So it is not to be just a conversation from North to the South, but it has to be a conversation between the Global South and the South, between Asians and Africans and the Latin Americans, or even the South Pacific. That kind of a collective uh, indigenous principles and practices would really help and transform theological education. And it is, it, it is quite demanding. It needs to be uh, sensitively done. And what, that's what I say, it, we, it is in creative tension that we need to engage. We have to be bold enough to move forward, but we have to be humble enough to see if we have done, if there's something incorrect, but through this conversation, we'll be able to mitigate and move forward. Finally, how do we bring innovations in course delivery? This is a very practical area. Now, I say this very often that we need to journey with our learner, that is student who comes, he comes with some experience. Do we take them into our context of learning? I think many of us need to understand the, the whole idea of adult learning, uh, the Bloom's taxonomy. When we, are, when, when we are creating curriculums, do we have clear aims and objectives uh, or, or clear learning objectives so that we would be able to make clear lesson plans? Or are we using the same lesson plan that our teachers had? Or have we not given thought? Uh, have we ever gone and made a lesson plan? How does it look like? A uh, what is a lesson plan? We just have some lecture notes and just go and deliver. But I think we need to have clear learning objectives. The learning objectives are those which would very specifically say that at the end of the lesson or the course, the students will learn this. And we need to make sure that our assessments are based on those as well. Secondly, it has to be a context-based learning. We need to critically interact with Western pedagogical methods and also give some possible indigenous pedagogical methods. I'll have to share this short insight when we were developing a course on principles of practice and preaching. Uh, I, was, uh, I was sharing with uh, the course writer who was from the Pacific. And I said to him, we use traditionally uh, the three point sermon or expository sermons but never do we understand that we from the global south have our own worldviews. And in these worldviews, the way that we have been taught, the way that we have been preaching is very different. For example, uh, in India, most of them, when they come and communicate and preach, it is more uh, conical. They will speak about the issue, move around and then come to the same point. Uh, I was told in the African context, it's more like star shape you have one major theme where you would go and talk about another aspect and then come back. Then you would go and talk about another aspect and come back. Whereas um, in, in, in each context, it will be different. And I was sharing this to the uh, course writer from the Pacific. And he said, how are you doing it in your own context? And he said, in our context, most of the preaching happens around food. And it is that it's in the context of hospitality that many people are able to share and teach. And I thought probably that's what we need to learn. And we need to unearth some of those indigenous principles so that we could bring them into our pedagogical uh, uh, ideas. Finally, we need to be creative in our assessments as well. When I say creative, there are different kinds of assessment. It's just not examination at the end of the, of the year uh, or end of the semester or end of the term. We could have in the form of essays, it could have portfolios, you can have oral examination, we can have open book examination, it could be a project. There are different methods. So we need to be creative enough to say, 
how we could bring such kind of innovations. Finally, let me bring this insight on innovations in research. Here, I have to briefly touch. Very often, we always have one idea that it's the Western form of research where we identify a gap, we do a literature review, and most of the literature reviews are in relation to what research has been done in the West. If such is the case, do we go beyond that? And many researchers from the Global South have tried to uh, give some new insights and new theories. Like for example, in the Asian context, we have the post-colonial theory uh, propounded by Ed Edward Said from the Middle East, and uh, we have two Indians called Spivak and Baba. And I'm told in the African context, the whole pedagogy comes around Ubuntu, which is a community-centered learning. If such is the case, how do we bring that kind of a pedagogy or theory into our own practice, especially in, in higher learning, in research, in master's research or in a PhD research? I was very impressed by this book by Paulo Freire, which is the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where, in the, where he brings uh, his, uh, his new understanding from, from, from the Latin American context where people who are on the margins are oppressed. If such is the case, how do we empower the oppressed to be more liberative and people who could go and create their own learning centers? Finally, I'm sure you must have heard about uh, decolonizing theory, which is from Linda Tuwai, who is an indigenous uh, New Zealander. Uh, and uh, she's trying to say how we should look at the theories, which is from not from the from the, the colonial past, but finding into our own roots and uh, our own uh, indigeneity, and to see how we could make it more 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 more, more special. So these are some of the directions that I thought would be very helpful. I know I've shared a lot in this uh, short presentation but I'm sure these are these just teasers. And as I said, it's just, I would want to say it's these are introductions. And as you try to engage in these uh, innovations in different aspects of, of curricula and pedagogical method, I'm sure you'll be able to find many. And I myself would be excited to learn from you. Looking forward to uh, hearing from you and interacting with you. Thank you so very much. It's my pleasure and I end my presentation here.